uh, and it will go up onto our very, very popular YouTube channel. In, still in search of our first 100 subscribers, which I think earns you 0.01 penny if you get 100 subs subscribers. So um, I think over to you, Kate, to start. That would be really good. Yep, thank you, Vaughan. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Kate McDonald, and I'm the Council City Centre Strategic Lead uh, with a particular um, role involving partnerships. And that is relevant to this topic because um, our approach to homelessness is very much based on a, something that we do as a partnership. So whether that's with a range of people from the voluntary sector, whether it's with the other statutory sector like the police or indeed fire, um, also businesses that we all, we all take a, an overall approach together to working with homelessness and with sleeping in the city centre. Um, you're going to have the experts really in um, Jenna and Dave telling you some of the operational stuff that we do. So my role is just going to give you a bit of an, an overview about how Manchester approaches it. And it's a, I think one of the first things to say is that we change our um, approach as the world changes around us and that we try and adapt. So we went from, a, for instance, the street engagement team used to be called the begging enforcement team. Um, but what we've understood is that for each person who you see on the street in the street community, there's an individual backstory and there's an individual reason that brings them there and the best way of stopping them um, exhibiting those behaviours that cause problems for, for businesses or for, for passers-by um, is to understand what underlies that and to put in some um, options for them. There's many of those who've got any options but our um, engagement hub has demonstrated that people do have options and can change their behaviour um, and therefore reduce the problems on the streets. The COVID experience, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that there was a scheme called Everybody In, which meant that there was funding provided centrally so that anybody who was rough sleeping was able to access um, provision that was largely in, in hotels. And that took a lot of organisation, was a massive effort, but we've seen some incredible results. Uh, not everybody chose to come in, but those that did, um, and I'm sure we'll, maybe we'll get some individual stories from, from Jenna and Dave later, but for some people being indoors for the first time in years, access to three meals a day, a safe bed to sleep in, a shower, it's really given them the opportunity to, um, you know, and actually also not least um, access to uh, scripts if they were substance misusers and to support and advice. So we've got a massive difference there and that's, that links into um, what we're seeing on the street now. Obviously, the shops reopened. The ones that um, the ones that have reopened was the fifteenth. How long ago is that now? Uh, I think we're into the are we into the second week. I've lost track. Um, anyway, so we saw more people come back into the city centre, um, but the, our approach now is taking a different tack in that. If we, if, when I say we, I mean the partnership and the street engagement team, if we sing people out begging who we know have got accommodation and they're just, you know, seeing, got their eye on the main chance really, then we're taking a much tougher line with them than, than we would have done in the past. And again, I'm sure that the team will, will tell you some more about that. Um, there was a question that came in that I've seen already that was about food and issues for people who we see on the street if the day centres aren't able to open and that is a very valid question at the moment. Our range of day centres are reviewing how they can safely operate and we're trying to have a, um, a like a, a, con a joined up approach to that so that not everybody's open at the same time and um, we can share the, the same the same approach so that the things that are being offered are for people who are rough sleeping, not for people who um, just fancy a free bit of scran, which is what we were seeing sometimes. We haven't got it solved and we continue to rely on partners like working very closely with City Co and with um, various different businesses. We definitely haven't got this solved and we're gonna, the economy that we're in and the challenges uh, post COVID 
potentially we're going to see new people on the street who have found themselves newly homeless. Um, but we have got a, 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 an approach to that that um, is, I think, in a much stronger position than a lot of other places, and particularly with a, we've got a very strong voluntary sector offer. Um, and when I say voluntary sector, just to confirm, just, I'm just winding up here, but um, I'm talking about people like the Booth Centre, who you'll hear from later, or Coffee for Craig, or Mustard Tree, or Barnabas, just to name a few. I'm not talking about the street kitchen type groups who are really informal, often inexperienced uh, people who don't see the big picture and aren't, aren't working jointly with us. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions and thank you for your interest. Okay, just on that, as it is one of the questions that's come up actually, because you, you talk about the difference between sort of the groups that we know are doing good are part of the partnerships and the, and the more unofficial ones. That's very hard for somebody who's just coming out of their office or coming out of their shops to tell. So where do people go to find out yes that's a good group and we can support those and and that's a little bit more unofficial group that possibly we don't want to support um yes thank you that's a very pertinent question well the fact that, that somebody even knows to think about that is a massive step in the right direction um and so i guess like any of us as private individuals if somebody is appealing to us for um support or donation we'd think twice about finding out are they legit or not so one of the key ways of doing that is to go on the street support website that will link in all the official partners and i'm sure the details of that can be can be sent after this um, but also something as basic as just have a quick look at the facebook page and if or look and then look for their own um charity websites because they're, they're an official statutory charity they will be registered with the charity commission and you'll be able to see that on their, um, they have an official number and all that sort of thing. Whereas some of the other groups, um, they may call themselves a charity because we use that word very loosely, uh, but they're not official. And that there's no, there's no then accountability, transparency, or um, potential understanding of some of the challenges and some of the safeguarding and risk issues. So that's that's how I'd suggest you you check. Okay, thank you. And generally, I mean, you, you talked you talked about the ending of the scheme for that was covering the COVID period. But are we expecting many more people into the city and particularly into the city centre? No. Um, so the people who went into the hotels, about 250 roughly speaking, uh, Manchester made a promise right from the beginning that we wouldn't be um, just bailing those people back out onto the street at the end of the period that the government said they were funding. And we, so that was to be at the end of June. And we begun that already and a lot of people have already um, been helped to find either private rented accommodation or a different type of hotel stroke hostel -y type accommodation um, so that they were not going back on the street and sliding backwards. Um, we're really pleased that actually the government has announced some further money to support um, the rough sleeping initiative that started during COVID. Um, it won't make us change our plans because we, we already knew as a city and as a partnership that you know you couldn't hand on heart get somebody to make so much progress and then just say right see ya at the end of june so um you won't be seeing those people coming back onto the street in the same way fingers crossed but i do think there's a i mean this is this, this isn't based on any um analysis or evidence it's just common sense and I, I'm, you know which i've got no more of that than anybody else but we know that there's a lot of people losing their jobs, et cetera, um, find it very hard during this period. So there are bound to be um, some people who may find themselves without somewhere to live. That, that's, that's what I meant. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, moving over. Now, it does say Alex King on the description, but as you can see, it's not Alex King for those, those that, that know Alex. Um, in, instead, we've got Jenna Southern and Dave Fisher. Um, joining us from the Street Engagement Hub. I, I don't know which one of you is starting, if you're going to do alternate words, how are you going to do this, but... <laughs> you're muted. Keep talking till we can hear you. Oh, there we go. Can't hear you though, so you're muted. It all worked during the run through.
Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Maybe it's just speaking a bit louder. <laughs> I thought we might get away with it. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to have to speak quite loudly, though. I'll move in a bit. Uh, so, hi, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Dave Fisher, uh, police officer with Greater Manchester Police in the city centre. Uh, I work on the street engagement team, uh, one of four officers that cover issues surrounding begging, uh, antisocial behaviour, and rough sleeping, homelessness, and we run the street engagement hub. I'm Jenna Southern, and I work for the antisocial behaviour team in the city centre. Um, so we deal with very similar issues, but uh, as I already mentioned, where there's associated antisocial behaviour to any begging and homelessness issues. Okay, guys, you're both going to have to really speak up, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On the laptop, it might be easier. Yeah, yeah okay, so up? there's a number of different issues that, that we're obviously kind of trying to tackle. Um, I know the number of these will be affecting your local businesses at any one time. Um, so the street thinking, obviously we're aware that's an issue across the city. Um, fly tipping, people who are sleeping and potentially blocking doorways of businesses, etc. Um, obviously the antisocial behaviour, which covers a wide range of behaviour, but we would class that as anything that's capable of causing harassment, alarm or distress for any person within the city. Human waste, unfortunately we do get a lot of reports um, of people using the streets, doorways and some of the less obvious spaces of the city centre as toilet. Um, obviously, discarded needles, um, if people have got substance misuse issues and they're living on the streets, um, then obviously we, we do come across where they've discarded those objects onto the streets. Okie dokie. Uh, squatting is on there as well, which becomes relevant if you've got an, an abandoned commercial premises. Uh, so any, anyone who has commercial premises not being used, it could be targeted by squatting. Um, it, which isn't illegal, uh, only in residential premises that it's illegal and it's not really a police matter and it always falls back to the, the owners of that property to seek court orders to evict people. You quite often just have the police and the council involved to prevent disorder um, and it's the very last thing that we'd be involved with there. Uh, so there's a few terms that, that are used very often around street community <clears throat> and around vagrancy in the city centre, homelessness, rough sleeping, begging and antisocial behaviour and to a degree some of them are a bit misleading because uh, homelessness it is a very wide ranging thing. People who have accommodation but temporary accommodation are still classed as homeless unless you have a tenancy or a mortgage you, you would still be classed as homeless. So that includes people that are rough sleeping and people who do sofa surfing, people even living with family that aren't you know, financially tied to that property. Um, so again, when, when you see people like rough sleeping, uh, generally the assumption could be made that they would be homeless, might not be the case. They might just be in accommodation, but staying out. The same with people begging. People look and, and I think begging is the face of homelessness across the city. You see a lot of people begging and people assume that there's a huge homelessness problem. Not quite the case. Um, we do find that around 50% of everyone that we deal with for begging has accommodation. Um, so they're not in uh, as bad a state as you might imagine, albeit not the best for being out there begging. Um, and the antisocial behaviour elements surrounding this are quite far and wide. It, there's litter, uh, human waste, as, as what was alluded to on the previous slide, but it, it brings a lot of other criminality to the street. Where we find people begging, we can't quite often find that there'll be issues with drugs, uh, dealing or drug use and alcohol misuse on the street. There's quite often issues surrounding safeguarding vulnerable people because of coercion or the begging, fighting over pitches and assaults that occur through people using other people's begging pitches and um, taxing people or, or charging certain, charging beggars to use the pitch. 
So there's quite a, a large element of safeguarding for us surrounding who sat down on the street. Um, and, and all of that started to build into more and more partnership work, having to have more agencies involved. Um, should I continue? Okay. So we need we shouting. I think we need to shout. Sorry, I might get a bit closer. No, it's all right. We can hear you now. All right, so good. Good. So uh, as a result of a lot of work through 2018 into 2019, we we saw that we, we dealt with a lot of people for begging. Uh, we arrested a lot of people. The, the idea behind it being get them off the street into the police station where we could give them some time to think. Um, we could assess their needs uh, more appropriately than on the street. And we could drugs test them um, because begging was a trigger offence for drugs testing in custody. And we got some quite amazing statistics from that in that 5% um, of people didn't test positive for anything. 7.5% um, of people admitted use of class B and C drugs and alcohol, things like cannabis, spice, amphetamines and alcohol. But the, the major statistic was 87.5% of everyone that we arrested for begging tested positive for a class A drug, that being heroin and crack cocaine. So we, we clearly saw that drugs, class A drugs, was a driving factor behind people begging and the major issue for them was accessing support around that, that, that drug addiction and scripting for uh, heroin, which could take two to three weeks. And when you're begging every day and, and your day consists of begging and then going buying drugs and using drugs, then going back to begging and buying drugs and using drugs, so you've got no time for housing appointments, benefits appointments, going, getting your health, checked um, and, and that not being able to get that help around the drugs because you would just stop begging and using was it was a, a major major blocker so we managed to get into the the powers that be and into the drug services and through the council and uh, tried to arrange same day prescriptions for, for methadone for heroin use which is how the hub came about the picture you see now involves members of GMP and the council, Riverside Housing, um, ASBAT, um, also the uh, outreach teams for the council, St John Ambulance and CGL Drug Services. There's, there's loads of people all working together for the same goal there. Uh, and it started to become a really popular thing. Do you want to add anything? Uh, okay. Um, to move, the, the sort of tackling some rough sleeping issues, the, uh, the numbers there are the average age of deaths of people sleeping rough on the street for men and women. Um, it's young, really, when you consider how, how long people live for these days. Um, so it, it's tackling that as well as tackling addiction and keeping the streets safe and a better place, a better community for everyone. pandemic and as they outlined we had started up the hub um, at the R Club near Strangeways and um, due to that the building actually closed due to Covid and um, so we had to think a little bit differently about how we could still deliver these services to the vulnerable people that we're still seeing on the streets of Manchester and um, so we decided to take our hub mobile and um, so this is a picture that you see today from us being set up on Market Street um, and we've set up a number of different locations across the city where we've identified that there's been particular problem hotspots. So last week we were on London Road up at Piccadilly. This week we've been on Market Street and to support kind of the opening of retail businesses and to support kind of anyone who's experiencing any issues with people begging outside of their premises. And again, as Dave mentioned, we've still been able to kind of sustain that same day scripting service where people require it. We have had to work a little bit differently. Not all partners are able to be there in person, but we've been able to set up kind of phone links um, with every single partner that we need to be there to kind of engage and do that wraparound support service for the most vulnerable people on the streets. Alternative giving. Alex is having a chat. Hello. Player three is into the game. So um, 
I wanted to just end the um, presentation from Dave and Jenna just to talk about where CTKO and our membership of the bid and our business community can come in. I mean, what we've really heard there is a really strong message around some of the um, issues around addiction um, and how people are begging and, and, and trapped in that cycle. So we and you as CTKO and bid members have been supporting a big change for a very, very long time. And this is the, um, this is the fund that we administer um, on behalf of partners to help people who really need the basics in life. So you might be rough sleeping and have found a tenancy but are unable to um, buy a, a bed or a microwave or a mobile phone and therefore can't keep the kind of appointments that, that Dave and Jenna have just set out. So Big Change has been going for around four years now. Um, we've raised nearly £300,000 and given almost £300,000 out of uh, to the community. Um, so we've got a little film here made by the people who have benefited from, from the funds. Um, and these are the actual voices of people who we work with um, and have received your generosity. It's really not my day, technically wise today. I do apologise. We had two two soundtracks on that on that um, particular film, but I hope that everyone manages to um, pick up the gist of what we do with uh, the money that we um, that we raise. Um, it's all um, given out very very swiftly. We've got partners, twenty nine charities across the city centre, some of whom are on this call um, this afternoon. Um, and it really does give um, businesses and individuals in the city um, a pathway to helping individuals but in a way that they understand is safe and secure and Vaughan and, and Kate talked about that in, in the earlier part of the, of the discussion this afternoon how do you know that your money isn't keeping someone um, in a situation that isn't good for them long term well if you want the safety and the security then I, was, I would suggest that big change is the, is the way forward I'm going to end that show now because it seems to be corrupted um, what you will have also have seen is some of the um, uh, campaign that the City Council very, very generously supported across the city. So this is the campaign asset um, and you are able to download that from City Co or the City Council and some of the descriptions of some of the, of the um, funding that um, you have supported um, is also available and you can use that um, corporately um, within your businesses. So I think I'll stop sharing the screen now Vaughan and hand over to Miriam if that's okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that that leads us really nicely into talking a little bit about the Booth Centre. So um, my name is Miriam. I'm the development manager. Um, I look after fundraising, comms, and finance at the charity. Um, for those of us that, for those of you that don't know, um, the Booth Centre we're a day service um, based over just off Cheatham Hill Road. Um, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, how we responded. Um, um, through COVID um, and a little bit about the, the service that we um, are, are providing now. So if you bear with me, I'll hopefully, hopefully the technology will work. There we go. Um, so I'm not going to read this, you can you can see our mission statement there, but um, really the, the kind of key values that under, underpin the Booth Centre
That's it. We're having a wonderful day today. <laughs> so I'm going to hope that Miriam comes back on. Um, question for Dave, Jenna, um, really looking at when you've had a street engagement hub out this week, um, I mean, what sort of numbers you're looking at? Uh, what's the reaction been? Um, how have things been going down? Speak a bit louder. Once you start speaking, we can it, usually the volume kicks in. Yeah, so since we started the mobile street engagement hub, um, we've had 69 people attend and engage with relevant different services, obviously each bespoke to that individual. And um, specifically this week, we had 25 attend on Tuesday just gone um, in the Market Street location, which was our busiest one yet. Um, and I think we'd had about five or six attend upon the point of us leaving there today to come here. Um, so a really kind of really good engagement and a lot of them have been with people we've struggled to reach before and so that's been really positive. And what should people do if they're actually getting somebody say in their shop front who is who are causing issues from them? Yeah so they can report it through to our team and so I'm sure you can share the contact details after this and um, we've got a contact telephone number they can report to us via email and then obviously we would link in with the street engagement team um, and get them a referral into the hub. Cool, thank you. There's also the option to do the live chat facility on the GMP website. It's, it's, uh, it's an alternative to phone in 101. There is no queue. Effectively, you get a call to take it back straight away. Uh, I've heard good things about it. Used it once and it worked. So. Okay, we will put the, put the numbers on the... Uh, the links that come out after this. Um, Miriam, you're back. <laughs> yeah, apologies for that. That was slightly embarrassing. My Wi-Fi just completely dropped out. It's one of those yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if if it's okay for me to to try and kick back on again, um, yeah, I'll try Please not share to share and start start where you were. Indeed, indeed, we'll do. Okay. There we go. So um, this essentially is just a, a minute and a half film, which will. Um, Sort of highlight what was going to be a big year for us it's our 25th anniversary and we had a fantastic year of celebrations planned um obviously covid put uh, pay to that but this should give you a flavor as to how we responded and and the service that we were running up until the back end of last week So that's uh, a little bit about uh, how we responded during COVID. Oh, excuse me. Where are we? Um, there we go. So um, I guess this is the bit that uh, you guys would be really interested in, in terms of how we've responded post COVID. So for those of you that are aware of the Booth Centre, sort of 
pre historically we were very much open door um uh, non-referral service um, and would serve two hot meals a day um, monday to friday um, and we could have up to 80 people at any one sitting um, and the center pretty much stayed full throughout the day um, now, now clearly we're just not able to um, reopen in those terms probably forever i think things will, will will change and certainly we've worked really hard to ensure that whatever service we have um put together in kind of co-production and collaboration with folks that access the service is sustainable the last thing we wanted to do was open our doors launch a service and then have to change it um, so i guess the headline there is we're not we haven't reopened the cafe um all the drop-in services because we just haven't been able to to do that um, and be compliant with um, social distancing restrictions. Um, but what we have done is we open the doors as a community centre and we're operating the same hours, which is nine to four, Monday to Friday. Um, and we're starting to um, reactivate our activities programme and I'll come on to that in the next slide. Um, historically, we would have two activities a day, quite often four activities because they'd be running concurrently. We're now only going to have one activity in the morning and we are asking everyone to pre-book onto that. Um, um, a couple of reasons. One, well, actually a number of reasons, but the, the three that I will um, highlight are we have to know who's in the building. We have to be able to uh, know who is um, attending each session. So should anyone become symptomatic, we're able to um, sort of assist with track and trace. Um, also because we we need to manage capacity to make sure we are still able to um sort of be responsible in terms of social distancing and also we this is something that came from the guys that, that access the center is actually having that sort of uh being able to mobilize and to that impetus to be able to um book onto a session and express sort of real interest is actually a really positive thing um and so so that's why we have adopted um sort of the, the sign on situation um for our, our activities program um and we've also reactivated our volunteer opportunities and group work that we do with people that um access our services and and once people are attending our activities we can then do much more of that wraparound um sort of support that we were doing during covid and that we've seen and we heard earlier on in the presentation that we know has really really worked for people that have um you know sort of have sort of long histories within homelessness and we want to be able to do that as well and take learnings from other partners that have had real successes in that. Um, so the activities that we are, um, are offering are job club and employment support and, and this is something that is so intrinsic to what we do and, and we would really look to um, hear from any organisations, be that on the call or, or that will watch the video after, that have opportunities within their businesses, within their organisations to offer entry level roles or any kind of structured work placements because um, we do have people that are really ready, fit and, and raring to go in terms of employment. Um, obviously our numbers are reduced in terms of how many people we can host so we are testing um, virtual job club um, as well as well as having people in the centre um, and we're doing some social distance drama games not quite sure how they'll work but I'll let you know because we're try trying those uh, tomorrow um, as well as arts and wellbeing sessions so some guided walks um, and obviously our gardening sessions are very very popular especially in weather like we've had um, as well as that, we're really mindful that people will know the booth centre is somewhere they can go in crisis, they can go and they'll be um, received being non-referral and we want to keep that. So we have said between nine and ten people can come to us um, and we can help signpost them to, to the various um, sort of uh, services that are operating remotely. Obviously a lot of them are, are now over the phone rather than face to face, so we want to be able to support people with that from nine until ten. Um, and some of this has already been covered, but how you can support not just the booth centre, but sort of the, the work that we're doing sort of as a, as a community and, and all the different agencies. Um, one thing that Crisis are doing, I know they're not Manchester specific, but they've got a fantastic campaign, which is lobbying the government around Homes for All. So taking all of the learnings that we've had, you know, we know we've got the solutions in terms of um, sort of stopping homelessness or, or turning that tanker. And we at Booth Centre are really proud to be supporting Crisis with that campaign. So I can send a link round or, or whatever as to how you can lobby your MP on that. 
Um, and Alex has already mentioned this, supporting frontline charities like the Booth Centre or Big Change. You know, Big Change are a huge supporter of ours and we just think they're ace. Um, so, you know, either support Big Change or us or any of the other charities in the city. Um, don't need to tell you that fundraising is, we're facing really uncertain times or, you know, there's a big hole now in our fundraising activity. So any support we could get would, would be incredible. Um, and of course, get involved with the homeless Manchester Homelessness Partnership, join the Business Action Group, Employee Action Group, based on what I said before, we're just desperate for opportunities to be able to offer people in terms of, of, of work. Um, and as I've already said, sort of get in touch if you've got anything that you think would, would fit, um, that, that would just be incredible. I can loop you in with the right person at the Booth Centre. Um, so I will close now um, my contact details are there um, we'd love to, to chat with you if you want to know any more about the Booth Centre um, if you've got any questions specifically about anything I've said obviously ask them now or get in touch with me later or indeed if you do want to support us so thank you so much for, for engaging with us this afternoon I'll hand you back to Ron Ron, you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> it's been wonderful today. I think instead of sending around the video link, we'll probably actually be doing this as, as notes afterwards, uh, as it will probably be the easiest way of, easiest way of doing it. Um, I was just about to pass over to Kate McDonald to answer David's question, but she's actually put that in the text. Uh, engagement going with the street kitchens. Um, what we'll intend to do after this, we'll run through all of the contacts here and also all of the processes that you need as businesses for those who haven't already got them and just as a reminder um, for what to do if you do see a rough sleeper if you do see somebody using drugs if you do see somebody um, acting antisocially or begging um, what that means who you can talk to who you can approach and indeed how you can help which is something that we've been involved with for probably five or six years now um, as Miriam said, big change is a very, very good thing, and uh, we're very proud to be involved with it, um, mostly through my colleague Alex, who you've seen running around um, trying to fix our various technical issues during this. Um, if there aren't any immediate other questions, please feel free to email us afterwards um, to ask us anything, and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, Kate, do you want to pop in? Yeah, thank you very much. I just um, I sent that response to the question from David Wilson about street kitchens before I finished typing, um, and I, so I hadn't properly answered the question. So if I've got a moment, I wouldn't mind just picking it's that up really, because yes. it um, the issue of the groups that we loosely call street kitchens is a a major factor for us in the city centre. On the one hand. Largely speaking, they're very good hearted individuals who want to help and with people they see as um, being down on their look, let's say. Um, in reality, we've got a situation in Manchester where we've perhaps got 10 street kitchen groups that are long established, um, who I know um and have some sort of relationship with and pre-covid had started um a regular meeting they were coming together um they, to, to talk with me and we were beginning to get a i would say a better understanding so they could see some of uh, the bigger picture um and indeed during covid some of the street kitchens who previously were most um disinclined if you like to cooperate with um, the way the partnership understood the, the challenges actually really came over to, to support us um, so we were running a, a food van ourselves at one point because there genuinely was a lot there were people who were hungry and not having access to food and we wanted to manage that um, so there's, a, there's that loose group who have got a name, who've got fairly regular volunteers, um, many of whom have got all sorts of um, expertise in, in, um, that's relevant, but they're not an official charity nonetheless. So they've got no safeguarding, they, um, formalities, no risk issues. And then we've got um, much more random groups who can just spring up out of nowhere. And um, one of the street engagement team was telling me about, for instance, 
um, one night last week, there was a group in Piccadilly Gardens handing out stuff. I'm not sure if it was trainers or what, I've forgotten. Um, and they said they'd come from a particular church in Stockport and just, you know, just thought it would be a good idea to, to rock up. Um, they were putting themselves at risk. They weren't social distancing. And they certainly weren't helping any of those key in, those individuals um, who were out on the street or in the gardens to actually address any of the, the issues that made them be there. And that's, I suppose, one of our, from the partnerships perspective, one of our, our biggest beefs with um, the, the groups that come up and give out stuff free is that sometimes it is stopping people from um, addressing some of their issues that would make them be able to make better changes to their lives. Um, I could go on and on about street kitchens, actually, but that's uh, um, the, the thing about the other part of your question. How effective are they about referring people into support? Well, none of them have got referral rights as such, um, but they would have, um, they would be able to signpost people. And again, that um, varies enormously. They, some have got a reasonable understanding of how to access, um, how to help advise somebody about accessing services, whether it's from a charity like the Food Centre or whether it's um, you know, coming to the town hall or our rough sleepers team. Um, others have got no idea whatsoever um, and actually give out inaccurate advice and do first aid on the street that puts people at more risk, etc. So um, like the first line of my written answer, really, it's a very mixed bag. Thank you, Kate, that's really helpful. Um, as I say, we will put all the links that we've talked about here from Street Support through um, Street Engagement Team to Big Change uh, on the mail that we do out to follow this up. And we will also put some notes from this. Um, we've been returning to this subject every month or so uh, for the past five or six years, and I'm sure we will continue to be returning to this. Um, if you do, as a business, have any issues you want to talk about, please get in contact. Uh, if you're with the bid, with, with the bid manager or with our ops team, and we'll help as much as we can. Um, we have a couple of Q&As next week, which I hope have fewer technical issues. Um, one with retailers uh, at, on our usual time at 10 o'clock on uh, Wednesday morning, where we'll be looking towards the changing in guidance uh, for the fourth. And then we'll also be looking at a nighttime economy uh, wider Q&A, again, looking towards opening of the city on the fourth. Uh, hopefully with police transport and city council so those dates will go out hopefully in the next 24 hours i would think um thank you all for joining us uh enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the weekend thank you